think with the, this morning's session we started off with was a, um, a long-term session where it's a, it's a, it's a multi-year project. And then in the, the tracks in between, I think we started to go into a short-term problem, short-term solution um, kind of track. I'm going to bring it back um, to the long-term solution, but also to a, um, a higher level view, an abstract view of, of what TechSoup does. And what I wanted to present to you is kind of TechSoup's idea with data, what they want to do with data. Um, in the, in, the, in the context of uh, helping nonprofits. So in the terms that you guys are typically serving a community, you are our community. So we want to serve you. So um, somebody just got Microsoft Exchange Server for $47, is that right? $42 for, um, as opposed to the retail price of an exorbitant event. So, um, so on, with that, so for you, those of you who don't know TechSoup, um, are, we're known for two main things. One is our product um, donation program, which um, where you as a nonprofit, a, a valid 501c3, can avail of uh, drastically reduced prices for our software because it's donated by the wonderful Microsoft, Cisco's, um, Symantec, et cetera. And then we're able to pass that on to you and uh, we validate you as an organization. Um, in the US, it's not so hard between GuideStar, um, between uh, business master file. There are lots of resources to be able to do this. Internationally, which we have the same program internationally, that becomes a lot more difficult. Um, in places, you can guess them, the UK, Australia, Canada, actually basically any kind of former empire, um, it's actually quite easy. Right? <laughs> they, ha they have a system in place that allows you to qualify them um, quite easily. And then the other aspect is, you guys may or may not have come across it, is your eligibility. Just because you're a 501c3 does not necessarily mean you can qualify for every product that's available. Um, and that's, that's mostly de defined at the business level through our, through our donor, so Microsoft, Semantics, et cetera. And the other part that we're f well known for is the community aspect. So NetSquared, in fact, um, Amy Sample Ward, who used to be um, our NetSquared coordinator with uh, Community Driven Innovations, now works for N10. So we have that relationship with N10, TechSoup um, Global. And it is really about the community grass. There, there are two main aspects. There's a grassroots community to this, where um, local chapters for, will come together and do a lot of work. And um, we also have developed a NetSquared platform, which is essentially a community-driven platform um, to allow communities to come um, we try and generate stickiness for you to come back. You know, it's no point in you just coming over once and then going away. So we want you to come back and have this community-centric um, focus. It is very much at the individual level. So while the product donation program is at the organization level, this is at the individual level. And it gets a bit complicated when we talk about data. Um, so why do we care about data from a TechSoup perspective? Well, our mission statement now, it used to be about has the technology resources to do their job, so giving you guys the technology resources. Now we want to do, give you the knowledge as well. And there are three main focuses that, from the data perspective that we're looking at. Um, one is, uh, A, we want to, when we evolve this program around the world, we're in 44 countries at the moment, as we evolve more, the more data we have about organizations, the easier it is for us to qualify the organizations globally. The second aspect is a marketplace, um, long, long term. So you know, five, eight years, we'd like to be a place that a marketplace of data. Um, there already are multiple marketplaces out there. Microsoft has a micro marketplace of data. Google has a, uh, they have a marketplace of data. It's somewhat restricted in terms of how you get access it because that's their secret sauce. But they do have it. Um, but when I gather talking to around people, is that there's a trust element within that, and we think we could be a broker, adding that trust element to you and data, and doing something wonderful with data. And then that's where we are at the moment, is trying to get um, that aspect taken care of. So what are we talking about here? We, we are slightly different um, in terms of the focus compared to what you guys are talking about. Um, we, we have multiple programs, and all of those programs evolved almost separately. Uh, one of it is a GuideStar program, which is the, the data services program. One of it is the product program, one's the, the community program. Now our problem is they, they, they have processes and systems in place individually, but they don't talk to each other 
because they've kind of evolved over time in silos. So we want to break down those silos and get together. So from a perspective for you guys, it's a little bit different. We are trying to get our current supposedly well-run systems to talk to each other. Um, you guys tend to have more of a problem of uh, you don't really ha you have the Excel spreadsheets and the, and the email and the, the whatever it is. I still have Excel spreadsheets on my computer too, so that's disclaimer. I, I'm not uh, I'm not immune, um, but you do try and get it into a situation where you want to get into the process again. Um, so I love this quote. It says we're 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 data rich, but information poor society. And and there is so much. You guys all know there's so much data out there in your own organizations. You probably have so much data lying around and post-its and whatever it is, and it's very hard to make sense of that and do something with it. And that what we want to do is break that cycle and create a, uh, hopefully a nicer cycle, which is from data you get information, and from information you get knowledge. And you pass that knowledge back in to data again. So you get this nice cycle that hopefully will grow over time and expand. This, this band will get bigger and bigger and bigger. But the key is, how do you manage all that? That's the big part. So from our perspective, we already have data warehouses, operational data stores, um, different systems. Our problem, we're starting to approach it very much from a big data solution. Um, I don't know if you guys know from what a big data solution is, but big data essentially is, is the big data. We take everything you can, and it can be uh, structured, semi-structured, unstructured. Try and make sense of it, do something with it, put it together. Um, the reason why we want to do that, one of the points I forgot on the other slide was that ultimately, we want to get insights on what organizations are doing so we can improve what you do better. I don't want to, I, I, so I had a conversation, um, and they said they wanted Microsoft Exchange Server. He went online, he bought the Exchange Server. Now, if I wasn't here, we might have had the conversation, it might not have happened. I want to be, we want to be in a situation where um, Cullum doesn't have to do that, that we will actually track him down and find out what he wants based on what he's doing online, forums, conversations in our community, and then find solutions for him, tailored for him, that he can do a better job what he wants to do. Classic example is um, we found that there was a need for uh, uh, a certain piece of software. We were able to go to a, uh, the company that provides the software and said that uh, there, we think there's a market for this, and they moved every single one of them. So they, they, they were, you guys won, they won, and we won. So that's what we want, a win-win situation for everybody. So that's what the big data is. We're talking about absolutely everything. We want to get anything, and we, have, we already have structured, semi-structured data, unstructured data on our hands. We have uh, blogs, social medias, we've got uh, content, websites. And, and t on top of that, we have our transactional data through the product donations program. We have our community data through individuals who may or may not be associated with organizations, might be a loose affiliation, might be a tight affiliation, but it's still a data point that we want to see if we can, uh, I'll use the word exploit, but try to leverage as much as we can so that you guys can do a better job. And what we're really talking about is you get data, you do something with it, and you explain the results. It's as simple as that. And this is, I'm not gonna go into a very um, solution-oriented architecture. This is just at a very high level. I want to give you guys a, um, my findings with working with TechSoup and data and uh, give you a blueprint. Go to all this data that's out there, all this massive knowledge that's out there, and distill it down and just focus on key patterns that you can use, best practices that you can use. So that's my aim for you guys to get out of this conversation is you can walk away here. If big data is something you're interested in, but just data management in general, it all boils down to search and acquire, explore and analyze, explain and share. So this is the, typically the world as we know it. Um, before the advent of big data, before Google and Facebook um, and people doing fun stuff with data, it really was a very simple world of structured data coming in. You may or may not use this data. Um, you probably throw a lot of it away or might get lost in a, in a system somewhere. Uh, somebody or something does something with it, defines where it goes, manages it. And then you create these dashboards and reports. Um, I'm not a big fan of dashboards, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a few minutes. I, they, they do have a place, but I think they're, they're limiting on what they can do, and what they, 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 instead of inspiring people to imagine, I think it, it, it 
gives them a crutch to, to leverage that may come outdated. So that's, that's my little spiel on dashboards. Um, and then ultimately, users may or may not use it. That's the whole point. And the problem with the, the, the dashboards is that they're not typically not flexible. They've been defined by somebody. It could have been defined five years ago. And we've heard multiple conversations about, you've got to look at what you're doing. Don't just say, I have a dashboard, and this is my metric, and everybody's happy and rosy. You've got to look at that all the time and iterate through it. Is it still relevant? Is it still relevant? Otherwise, you're just going to get um, outdated and outsourced. I think I've had a couple of conversations with people said, somebody asked for something in a report. They gave it to somebody else, who passed it on to somebody else. And what came back was nothing what the person wanted initially. And then they have to go through the whole process again of defining the requirements and producing this artifact. What I'd like to do is empower users. The people who want this information at the end, let them define what they want. Let them play with it. It's difficult. I'm not saying it's, it's trivial. It is very difficult, but it's, um, it's rewarding. Initially, it's fun. And some of, you'll see some of the stuff later on when I talk about the insights. It's fun. Right? I mean, so data is supposed to be boring, but actually it can be very fun. And um, the, if you give these, enable these end users to do what they want to do with it, then their world becomes richer and more empowered. So really, it's about empowering people. So this is the world, I call it the Datrix, that we're getting into. And we have, this is just TechSoup, by the way. This is TechSoup data. So we have transactional data, of don donation product sales. We have structured, unstructured. We have um, sub-transactional logs. So we have web logs, uh, social media, call center data. That's, that's all distinct siloed data. And then we have our non-transactional, which is huge, which is growing exponentially. Web pages, blogs, content. Physical events is a good one. Uh, San Francisco will like this because um, we actually had to move our data center. And one of the data points was, what are the seismic events in San Francisco? Because that's why we had to move. So that's an important. And on top of that, you've got all these application events, machine events. There's events coming at you left, right, and center. On top of that, these guys are all in this space working on trying to do big data, help your life better. It's colossal, and I just feel like giving up sometimes. <laughs> but there is hope, and that's the key. I feel like Obama. Is that, that, can, I, should I, can I say that? No. <laughs> there, is, there is hope. No, but so you, if you boil it down, it's, it really is about three main themes. It's about big data, so you get it managed, you analyze it, do something with it, and then you distribute your results, get it seen. You want to get it out there so people can see the benefits of the, of the work you've done. There are two things which scare the life out of me. Um, well, the first one is the biggest one, privacy. Data privacy is what kind of uh, prevents me from just doing the first three pieces. So if you can think of, the, think of these three, the three top pieces as being that horizontal piece. Data privacy just encompasses the whole thing. The same with domain data. Um, it can get very territorial with your domain data. Data privacy, um, going back to what John said this morning about um, walking to, uh, saying I'm tweeting, I'm going to get a, a, some cheese, and he gets back to the response from them, the shop saying, hey, welcome, come. That, I know that would scare the life out of some people. John probably embraced it. I would embrace it. Um, we talked, uh, I think Evan talked before about how he gets tr <laughs> followed around on websites because of what he was doing beforehand. And that can scare the life out of people. And that's where it gets this mistrust has evolved. And I think that for me, TechSoup, what we'd like to do is establish ourselves in a place that we can be that broker. We can be the place of trust that you can come to that you already established and then um, work with us to help you get better. Go ahead. Go ahead, microphone or? So, so the, quest, the question was, um, where is the line between big data and small data? Um, I, think, I think if you were to, to sum it up, um, small data for me is your, is your typically structured data. So what you already have in Access databases, uh, Excel databases, um, something you can get your hands on in a spreadsheet-y kind of way and do something with it. Big data is, um, encompasses that and totally unstructured data, social media, um, Tweets, uh, Facebook posts, Google Plus shares, right? So it is taking all that information, which is very hard to manage because it is unstructured. So when you get into this world, it, this, 
this unstructured world, you, it's very hard to interrogate that data. And we talked before about um, uh, one of the pre previous presentations, there was uh, solar, uh, Apache Solar, which is actually one of the, a very good tool for um, interrogating data from a search type index. So if you can imagine what Google do, that's big data. And we're talking about petabytes of data. We're talking about huge cross amounts of data. You know? and, and we, just ourselves alone, we are in that situation where we're looking at a lot of data. And before, we just throw it away. And it's valuable. Sure. Typically, yeah. I mean, it's, it is quantity as well, so you have to look at it from a quantity. But when, I, when, I, you know, when we're talking about quantity, it's petabytes of data. I mean, it's not, you know, um, it, this is internet traffic data type stuff. And that's what these big companies are dealing with. We don't have petabytes, but we have terabytes. So it gives you an idea. Does that answer your question? Um, so I wanted to give you some, some kind of guiding principles. So, so big data characteristics. Um, there are the unstructured data, but typically it is mostly of the structured, semi-structured type. It still resides in that world. We haven't gone completely to just people um, throwing out their brains into a, into a website and you know, being consumed. That doesn't exist just yet. Um, it's typically a single source of data. It's of large volume, so it's, it's big. Um, it's not aggregated or summarized. You can aggregate and summarize. So go back to what Sean was talking about this morning. Um, they do the aggregation of data. You, you lose, there are certain characteristics that you will lose once you aggregate, and it's very hard to go back. Now, I'll give you a, a good example is, um, you've all seen those little charts of like, uh, by state, could be voting, could be poverty, right? And it's, it's kind of like, you know, there's red, there's blue, there's green, shades in between. But it doesn't tell the full picture. Now, when you start to zoom down in, and you actually go to a, a, a location, that a, a charity is interested in. So an organization is on the ground, boots on the ground, working in a particular district or region of a city. They're more interested in knowing at that granular level which household is affected, which household isn't. Just going back up to that top level tells me Florida is doing well when maybe it isn't, for example, or Massachusetts is doing well. So that once you go to the aggregation level, you do lose a lot of um, information, which loses knowledge. Um, and then geocoding, of course, that's a classic example. Geocode everything. Um, somebody gave the example you're on that it, you, they, they geocode your, your, your phone, so now they know when you're walking along, running along maybe, and they can figure out walking trails um, around the city just based on what, you, what you're holding in your hand. It's mind-boggling, but it's great, though. Um, big data deals mostly with known questions. Um, you can use it to handle unknown questions. What I mean by that, we'll, I'll talk about a bit later on, but essentially, they're, they're dashboards. You have, a, you have a problem, and use the dashboard to fix it. Um, most problem statements are in the magnitude of $1,000 to $10,000. This is not the million dollar question, million dollar solution answer. This is that, God, I wish you knew the answer to that, but it's like, you know, who, what are the lottery numbers for the last five years? Well, you go to Google for that, right? And that's what it's all about. You, it's, they, let them take care of that solution. Big data solution is not that expensive. It costs 10 cents per terabyte of data, I think it is, or per gigabyte of data it's now, physically. To buy 10 cents, buy a, t a gigabyte of data is 10 cents. Years ago, it probably would have cost you a hundred, couple hundred dollars. Um, and the last one is, the big thing is that um, big data doesn't fit into a traditional relational database model. That's why I talk about the unstructured data. You can't just take it and put it in, because if you do, you lose stuff because you might put it in the wrong place. So it doesn't typically reside in a, a relational database model. Um, some of the principles, uh, it tends to be raw and structured data, low infrastructure costs. However, you're not going to run your report real time and get your results back. It's going to take a long time. This, this is, when you traverse this amount of data, it actually is quite a, a, a number crunching exercise. It's not something you don't, you don't get your answer back straight away. Um, we want to store all the data don't throw anything away. It's like your mother used to say, right? Don't throw anything away. Because you never know who's going to use it. And it's true. You don't know. You may not have a use for a piece of data. And somebody else might come along in five years and go, I wish I had that, that piece of data. You go like, yes, I do, actually. And then you can go give your answer. And then ETL is now this. So ETL is the um, extract, transform, and load. 
it's now, in big data, it's called clean, score, and export. So you cleanse your data, you score it by weighting it a certain way, you, you assign importance to you based on models, and then you export it. And then the big data, big, the analytics and visualizations, how do you share this data out? Um, business intelligence is used to analyze. All those vendors you saw on the previous slide, um, the 50 some odd vendors, only a, a small section, they're into the business analysis world, business intelligence. Um, iterate, iterate, iterate. Oh, by the way, you don't want to throw away what you've already done. This is, this is coupling. This, the work you've already done, data warehouses you have, databases you have, reporting you already have, this sits under this and feeds into this. So you don't get rid of what you have. You're not going to go to your CEO and say, hey, you know what, database we spent like five million on, we're getting rid of it. You don't do that, you add to this. And then you iterate, 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 incremental releases, you're always wondering what's, what, what, what's, what am I missing? What is this still relevant? And then the last one, allow people to generate. You're empowering users to do it for themselves. Enable them to do their own work because they're the ones who know the answer and give them the tools to do it. You want to be able to interrogate the data anytime and ask any question. They're the characteristics, the fundamentals. So why do we need this? This is a big headache. 90% of big data is horrible to work with. Development environments are not easy. If you guys are, I don't know if you guys have ever coded in this stuff, it's just horrible to code in. Um, there are different sources of formats, so managing this data is really complex. Different outputs, um, different questions and problems, different mu user communities, and you need a scalable architecture because this data has to reside on a lot of data uh, storage areas. And the answer is, people don't use big data because they want to, it's because they have to. And that's what Google's doing, that's what Facebook is doing. And that's what TechSoup ultimately would like to do, is use the data it has to try and analyze it to make the capacity building of nonprofits uh, easier, better. Find places where they have a need and do something about it before they have to approach us for a need. So it's being proactive in trying to do problem management, problem solving. So this goes back to the waste not want not model. Um, this is what we do now. This is what we do in TechSoup. We um, have data sources and we either put it on tape that nobody ever goes to see or we put it in the trash. We just don't care about it. And then eventually it goes up to these data marts and we have our BI and we do our reporting. Life's great. So what if, instead of throwing it away, you had a system of these, this data lake concept, just put it all in this data lake, and then farm it out to those systems that need it. Nice and simple, kind of a bit of fun. But um, you don't throw away what you have. You have a data warehouse, keep it. Now just feed it new data, new data points, and do something with it. This is what a basic solution would look like in a big data world. This is a do-it-yourself. Do you guys have DIY here? That's a European term. So do-it-yourself. Uh, if you want to, feel free to go ahead and do this. <laughs> um, uh, it's complex. Um, it's hard to manage, it's, but it's possible. And it's not that expensive. But you do have to um, invest a lot of time and money into it. You could cloud it. So there are already services out there for doing big data cloud. You can, you can call up Microsoft tomorrow and they'll give you a big data stack in the Azure cloud. And they'll charge you for it, but you can still do it. Um, Google has one. It's a bit more restrictive in terms of access to the data. It tends to use their API. That's their magic sauce, right? So you get the benefit of their magic sauce on top of, of, of them managing the system for you. And then Amazon has, a, has, a sim, has a, another um, example as well. The data sets are the most interesting. Um, they, both Amazon and Microsoft have a marketplace of data. You can go there. You can, there's data out there. You can go get these marketplace data sets, bring them into your, your, your world, and do stuff with it. There's nobody stopping you. So it, there is stuff out there to be done. Or this is where TechSoup want to come in. And they want to be the provider and leader of um, in civil society information globally. And what we want to do is exactly what I said. Get the, these data points. Manage it for you. Take care of it and then do, they, do analysis with it and give you back the results. In a place where who does what, where, and how. You guys can benefit from that, that model. But it's, this is a long-term you know, strategy. It's not something that's going to happen um, in one, two years. It, this is like a five, 10-year model. So that's, bear with me. That's basically where we, where we would like to go to. Um, some do's and don'ts. So some of the things I've learned um, the last year and a half. Um, do explore, 
Uh, there, I've, do you guys know the target um, problem where they were doing data analysis? You guys heard this one? So the target did, um, did this data analysis. They were, they were like, you know, we want to we capture, well, capture is a bad word, we want to know who are expectant moms. And we'll, we'll market to them. So they came back and said, um, they looked at their analysts and said, can you, can you find us the data points that will indicate somebody is in their second trimester of pregnancy? And the guys went away and they thought about it and they came back and said, we, you know, we think we have a crack. And fair, I mean, fair, they did it. And they were mar marketing to um, uh, women in their second trimester until a very irate father came in to a Target store demanding to see the, mar the, the manager and was irate saying, what are you doing sending these to my um, school age kid? And um, how dare you? And just apologize and they all went back up to the top of corporate Target. I think they stopped doing it. Um, long story short, it turns out that Target were right and the dad was wrong. But that's a good line. They, they got away with it, but that's a close one. And that's a very close one. So be very careful how far over you go into people's privacy because it's just not, not worth it. Um, don't aggregate process at the lowest possible level. Um, data scientists, these guys are now the rock stars of big data world. Um, they, I've met a couple of them, they're quite amazing. They have this capacity to understand your data better than you do and do something with it and visualize it for you. And so it's, they, they, they do pay good salaries, but it, they are really um, worth their weight, but there aren't that many. So it's a, it's a, it's a short, a scarce commodity. Um, don't throw anything away. Don't be afraid to fail. And I said, don't replace existing. What you have now, don't replace it. Build on top of it. And no is equal to not now. When somebody says to you, no, I can't do it, it just, just think it is not now. This is in its early stages, um, not something that's going to happen in the next year. So just go with it. But basically, it's all about stacking it up and predicting the future. So you create this big data stack of, of uh, systems. And you try and predict the future. That's what it's all about, trying to predict the future. Right, I'm going to pause there for a second if anybody has any questions about this portion. I want to get into the next section I want to get into is looking at why would you want to do this? So be good. All right, no takers. So I was, at a, I was at a conference. I love this next quote, but I was at a conference. I never quite thought about it this way. Um, uh, at the start of the year, there was a guy called um, Avanish Kauchek. I don't know if you guys have, if you ever get a chance to see him, the guy's awesome. Um, he's the only person I think I know that can swear in a presentation and get away with it. But very funny, very entertaining. And, and he, he, he presented this um, inspirational source of data analysis that I hadn't thought about before, and it's quite brilliant. It's this Rumsfeld quote about the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. And he boiled it down to these three distinct cases. The known knowns are your, your dashboards, they're your problem statements, right? So you, you, you've, you already know what you want to know when you get this data out, right? The known unknowns are, tend to fall into the data hack category. So have you guys ever worked with Data Without Borders, now called Datakind? So Data Without Borders will take your, so they go to communities and they'll take the nonprofit data and they'll mash it up with other pieces of data that they have access to. And they'll come out with, um, they'll have problem statements and they'll come out with solutions to those problem statements. One of the things they recently did using GuideStar data is that they were able to define what are well-performing charities and what are not well-performing charities based on the data. And they actually did, were able to develop an early warning system for charities who are about to do bad things or not performing as well as they could and try and catch it in time and then go back and rectify it. It's not a penalization system. It's just a matter of making them better. But the, the me, the part, this is the meaty part, the unknown unknowns. When you're on your journey to the other pieces, there's so much other information you just don't know you don't know. If that makes sense. And it's, it's out there waiting to be explored and, and found. But you have to have that journey. You have to have the confidence in the journey. So this, to me, this quote is, is gold. Because this is, uh, I want to get to the unknown unknowns. And the problem is, at the moment, with data, you probably guys have done this with all the data sets, right? You look at the top 10, and you look at the bottom 10, but the real me is right in that middle. I can see the top 10. It's not going to do me much good. I can, see the, I, can, I can reorder it so it's reversed, sorted, 
Now it gives me the bottom 10, but that's where the meat is, right in there. All that information about those organizations, right in there. And that's what we want to get at. That's what those unknown unknowns we want to get at. I'll give you some examples of, of these kind of uh, using how many have been looking at the site. That just gives you an, ex an example of what's, you know, what's possible. Sure, go ahead. Perfect time, actually. Go ahead. No, um, so no, GuideStar US, uh, so the question is, does TechSoup own GuideStar? So the answer, I'll write in the camera, uh, no. Uh, te TechSoup does not own GuideStar. TechSoup, um, my background is with GuideStar International. Yeah. So the founder of GuideStar, um, what used to get calls from people around the world saying, we love GuideStar, can you do that for us over here? So he thought, aha, um, there's a business model. So he started GuideStar International, which, there's a, loot, there's a close affiliation. We are, um, I actually live in Williamsburg, Virginia, and they're in Williamsburg, so um, there's a close affiliation between the two, but no, they're not the same. That's your question? Anybody else, else got any other questions before we head on? This is just a bit of fun. Um, data is fun, so I'll show you in a second. No? So actually, I'll move back over here. I want to go to um, bring up some uh, websites. So this is one of the first websites we did, uh, visualizations, I should say, based on our data. And uh, what it is is um, non-US product sales around the world. And it's like, a, that's like a horse race. I love Germany. That's great. Look at them. They started out like you know uh, only a few years ago, and they're top head of the list. Um, and it was fun. It, they, um, we showed this around to various people, and they're like, this is great, this is great. This is about a year and a half ago, two years ago. And we said, oh, we showed it around. So we showed it around. <laughs> we made the mistake of showing it to actual our partners. So we went to Ireland and Spain and said, what do you think of this? And um, that was a bad idea. Uh, because um, you get, your eye gets caught to the winners, but there are some losers here too. Right? So they said, well, you know, this doesn't tell the whole picture. So we said, so what is the whole picture? You tell us. He said, well, you know, Spain and Ireland, we've had a recession. It's been bad. Times have been tough. Um, Germany have um, a larger share of the market. They have more nonprofits. So this, is, this isn't fair to us. So in good um, uh, horse racing terms, we, we basically handicapped the field. So we said, well, you know what? You're right. So you tell us the, the various pieces that um, are going to make a difference. So they said, well, you have to wait. So this is now, we took the same data, a little bit more updated, and did a heat map of where it is around the world. So you can kind of see where, you can see where we're located. It's kind of funny. I mean, it's like where you think it would be, right? Uh, very little down in Africa, except South Africa, a great partner. Um, but also very interesting in um, South America, Brazil, actually. And then what we did was we looked at the bottom and we said, okay, well, that's, that's our raw data. So we presented it in a different way. And we said, now let's, put some, let's weight it with some indices. So we took, um, on the donation side, we said, well, how many NGOs does TechSoup manage in that country? So by the way, if you haven't met, we've three, million, uh, three billion in, in uh, sales. Um, that's manufactured, recommended. That's not what Cullum just paid. That is what it would have cost if we hadn't had the donation program. So we basically saved a lot of money. <clears throat> so we, we said, well, first one, we'll, we'll, we'll pair t TechSoup NGOs under management against donations. We'll also do the GDP. Let's be fair, right? Countries have different GDP. So let's wait it by GDP. We'll do it by income. It's by, by per capita income. And the last one is the Big Mac index. I love the Big Mac index. It's a, it's a purchasing parity number. So it basically says that, um, if I buy a Big Mac in the US, that's the same as me buying a Big Mac in Hungary. And now we're all equal. Now we're talking about the same thing. So what we did was, if you look at these with some um, little infographics. So this is against GDP. So based on GDP, now we'll see that Bulgaria, wow, they did a great job. Um, so did Australia, so did New Zealand. Um, Unfortunately, Ireland and Spain still didn't do so well. So, but um, Belgium did very well. But, but you can see the US, in terms of sales, the US is huge. But now when you weigh it against GDP, 
that's a whole different perspective. And that's, each of these fields here is all about some weighting index based on various factors. So if you look at Bulgaria, we actually sold the equivalent of 369 million, over 369 million Big Macs in Hungary. So, um, or, or Bulgaria, I should say. So our donation program, that's how many Big Macs they sold. So it's just a bit of fun, but it's more than fun. It actually gives you a very um, insightful view into what's going on in the world, in your world. You'll notice the first um, uh, visualization I showed you was, was a, dare I say, rudimentary. Well, that was done by us internally, developers having fun with Google API. This was done with an organization, a, a company, design company. Um, if you're doing visualizations, I strongly recommend <clears throat> that you do use a company for visualizations because they know what they're doing. And the, the, the criteria is they need to understand your data quickly, and they typically do. And they need to do a good job of, of and look at the other work they've done, and do a good job of, of, of sharing it around. So these are some of the reasons why we at TechSoup do visualizations. We do it for infographics. Um, we do it to answer some questions. We do it for tell a story. I'll get to tell a story in a second. And we do it just for fun. That's you know, part of the reason why we do it. Um, this is a fun one, uh, but it's kind of uh, uh, infographic related. So there's a can we do run, through the NetSquare program, we run campaigns. And um, one of the campaigns was anti-corruption. And what this is, is the same anti-corruption theme, but each country's different perception of what it means to them. So in Romania, they actually have dead people voting. So they actually are able to use the names of dead people, keep them alive somehow, and have them vote. Um, in the Czech Republic, you have to bribe. You're bribed for your vote. So there's a whole bribery scandal. And in Slovakia, there's this big gorilla. They just, the Slovakian government is just like, there's them and there's us, and I'm, I can't even bribe you. I'm, you're just too scary. But that's the same anti-corruption theme seen through a different lens of different countries. So it just, it can convey at that local level. And what we're all about from TechSoup Global is we're about um, global reach, local impact. So we wanna, we wanna be all around the world doing what we do and impacting locally. So the last one I'm going to show you, a second to the last one actually, I'm just going to, this is a, um, goes back to somewhat of what the guys this morning were talking about. This is um, telling a story, essentially. Uh, and what this is is that um, we, we're our own, you know, I'm preaching about big data. Um, we just got this data recently. So what this is, is these are testimonials from our uh, uh, people who bought software from us. So if you guys bought software from us, you'd send us a story saying, what was the impact that that purchase had? And that's essentially what it is. It's saying, around the world, <clears throat> it's using Microsoft's impact map, but around the world, I'll present the story of what happened with my donation. So you can actually go and look at it in more detail and say, like, down in Africa. Or maybe not. I might be there. There we go, click away. So basically what it is, it's going to be, um, when, we try, when we try to, when we have some rules about when the organization is sending us the information, we really want to tell the story first. That's at the top, usually visually compelling. That's at the top. And then it goes down into actually what happened. You'll see further on down is a description of what the impact was and how it worked. And with this interface, you can search different people um, around you. You can search on themes that are of interest to you. Um, so you can actually, this is, goes back to the, the impact aspect and the corporate social responsibility of you guys. Um, this is huge. Because this little thing here is massive because if you think about it, this is a full circle. Microsoft gave product, donated product to TechSoup. TechSoup passed it on to this organization. The organization used it to help people on the ground, beneficiaries. Fed back the information back to us give back to Microsoft, the Microsoft can say, look what we're doing. And this goes with any, any of this. So this is real impact work and closing that, that cycle, that loop, to go from what actually happened. One of the other things we talked about was um, th this, uh, this gives you qualitative analysis, right? 
We sold the product, quantitative. These guys are telling me what happened to this product after they purchased it, qualitative. Another example of that is uh, the, the well example I've seen used. Um, you get granting, you grant to, do it, to build a well in Africa. You build, you build your well, but the water sucks. You don't know, because what you do, you send back your information saying, check, built the well, all right? I get my money, everybody's happy. Well, if you crowdsource what's actually going on there, so there was one organization that actually um, made an agreement with a local carrier, and they put a phone on the side of the well. And they gave free text rates for free text messaging from this phone. People were able to go and say, the question was, how's the water today? And they were actually able to key in, send a message, get by qualitative data saying, water's great, water's great, water's great. Now you've got a real impact story that says, yes, I built the well, and yes, the water's great. Because if not, they should be going back to fix the problem. So that gives this extra step of impact that you may not have had before. And the last thing I'll leave you with from a visualization perspective, I love this. So this is, these are the things meatloaf would do love for. I mean, yeah, okay, <laughs> the old people are laughing. Sorry, no offense. I, I love this, because would he do anything? Would he do that? Well, 100% of the time, he'd do anything. So it can be fun too, right? But it can tell a story. So these are basically, what I tried to give you was that abstract view of what you can do with data. Very high level. I'm not saying it's easy. If you want to go down to that level below, it is very difficult to do, very difficult to manage. Um, TechSoup would like to fill that void, ultimately, long term. In the, in the meantime, we'd like to get the data we can get and do stuff with it, so to help you guys do a better job. And these are just some of the various um, links. You can get them from the, from the, the website when the presentation is, uh, is, is downloaded. And that's it. Um, you can contact me there, and uh, I'll be at the happy hour too, so. But, any questions now? Serious questions now, not the happy hour questions. Because I know for a lot of folks, like data visualiz visualization is a um, you know hot topic and a big issue. Um, is anyone working on visualizing their data, or has done, or great? So can we can we pick on you to just talk a little bit about it? Has it been a struggle? Has it been <laughs> you're both saying not me? Okay, but but your colleagues could really benefit. Or, or just say a little bit about it. Like has it been easy as pie? Has it been a struggle? Has it been? Well, we are just in the beginning stages. We feel like we need to better um, you know, have some visualizations of our data so that people can understand us better. We're an organization that brings tutors and mentors into the Cambridge Public Schools. And we have about, a, a, last year we had 830 tutors giving 51,000 hours of service. And those are very diverse kinds of service. And so it, talking about us, even though we're a small organization, is harder than it should be. And so we want some nice uh, visualizations that sort of show our impact and uh, you know I think that we are getting there I, you know part of our issue is that we're using volunteer also pro bono designers pro bono you know the kind of people that we're using are people um, who are able to do it for free for us and so that constraints sometimes I feel like I can't call them too many times in a day for instance or I can't if I'm asking them to work on one problem I can't ask them to also work on another problem so those are some of the things that we're just grappling with, but you know, we do tap into volunteers primarily for direct service, but we also ask volunteers to be our social media interns and you know, do things yeah. in, that would help us um, and bring their skills to our organization. I, I, so the one, one thing I've, we have found is that um, you, you have to pay. <laughs> no, because the, 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 the skill levels of these guys, a good, guy, a good one from a bad one is night and day. I mean, they, we, we brought our data to them and I said, they understood it. I mean, they were Roma they're from Romania. And they, they understood our data better than we did. And they started to come up with ideas. What if we did this? What if we did that? And um, fortunately, we had another person internally that was very that way minded as well. So the two of them together was, was just wonderful to watch. But, but we got a reduced rate. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, you do, have to, you do have to, for the real professionals, because we're a very visual world. If you don't have a good infographic that doesn't grab you, it's lost. Great, we have another question over here. Well, 
Actually, I just wanted to, um, I, I know this is not, we're not supposed to be platform specific, but I know a lot of people are using Salesforce as well um, here. Uh, I would really encourage you to look at the app exchange. Um, there are no free products, nothing's free, that will do yeah. this kind of stuff, but there are a couple products that out of the box can do visualizations based on, mostly they're basically geocode um, based, so uh, any, any object that you have in Salesforce, any record um, can be put on a map almost instantly um, and with very little technical know-how. The higher end stuff, especially when you start comparing cro across indices like GDP, that I, I don't, it can't do. But if you simply want to see heat maps of the number of people in a specific location, the number of do uh, dollars raised, uh, the average size of donation, um, the number of activities, uh, uh, either broken down by county, state, or worldwide. There are a bunch of different apps. The, the only one I'm truly familiar with is by a company called AeroPoint. It's called GeoPoint. Um, I think it's under like $10 a month. But for very basic visualizations, um, that's, a, that's a, the, one of the ones that I've seen out there. Uh, but yeah. the App Exchange is constantly, uh, I know there's similar things like the App Exchange in, in um, platforms aside from Salesforce. So this is not a Salesforce bug. Um, <laughs> it's just what I'm experienced with. But they're constantly evolving, and usually uh, they're started by small, by a single guy who breaks off from a company, a bigger company like Blackbot or, or formerly Convio or Salesforce or whatever, and they think they have a great idea, and they'll put it on the App Exchange, charge 10, 100 bucks a month, and that's that's how these things get started. So, I just that ta Tableau Public is one that's good. It's a, it's fully free. Um, it is rudimentary, but it's it's, it's like uh, Excel on steroids, I guess. So Tableau Public is a good one. T-A-B-L-E-A-U, but it's free. Excellent, and I'd also advocate for G-I-Y-F, that Google is your friend. Uh, that uh, if you Google nonprofit infographics, there's uh, several places that aggregate them and, and have some great examples that can just help you start with thinking about it or showing good examples. Deborah. Hi, thanks. Um, this is just another point of information about data visualization. Um, anyone who's talked to me for more than 30 seconds already knows this, so uh, forgive me for being um, redundant. But um, I just want to mention that right here in Massachusetts, a uh, very major data visualization platform has been developed at the University of Lowell. It's called Weave. So think looms in Lowell. <laughs> uh, it was really very consciously named that. So it's called Weave. And you can download it for free at OIC, uh, OIC the letters, OIC, weave.org. Uh, the guy in charge of it is a professor of computer science called uh, George Grinstein, and he is extremely eager. He's approached me about giving free training in data visualization to nonprofits in Massachusetts. So, and and he's basically he's saying, "What's my legacy? I want to make sure this software I have developed." Um, is going to help make the world a better place. So you're exactly who we'd like to talk to, ev everybody in this room. So I just want to say, I don't make any bucks out of this. I just want to say, <laughs> I'll be happy to put you in touch with him if you give me here his. If you give me your card, I'll pass on your information to him, and uh, see if you can get a free training in data visualization from a professor of computer science who does know what he's doing. Anybody else? Great. Help me thank Stephen. Great job, Stephen. Okay. Great. So I just want to um, thank you all for um, coming here um, because I think it was really helpful. I heard a lot of great, you know, thinking and comments today. Um, I'm wondering if a couple of you might share something that you're going to walk away with today to, you know, help our presenters understand, like. Is there something that stuck in your mind? Was there a piece of advice? Was there a resource? Is there something when you go back to your office tomorrow, you're going to say to your colleagues, so yesterday at this event, I heard. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, uh, I thought that. Um the dashboard uh, uh, with um, Miss Barry was uh, extremely, extremely useful, and, so, and uh, it's an exercise basically of figuring out what's the data we need, how are we going to use it, how do we organize it, um, 
and why, uh, I thought that would be something I'm going to take back to my colleagues uh, and try to do that kind of same exercise with them as a group uh, across departments. And I think that'll be useful. Great. And for those who weren't in it, um, can you just give that brief description? Did she have the group yeah. come together? You had a big sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. we, had a big, uh, we had a big sheet of paper where we basically talk about um, organizational data, things that help our organization run programmatic uh, data and then what's the what I, what are we measuring that will actually what, what's the data to know whether we've achieved our mission's goal or so to help you give that clarity but also to make sure everyone around the table yeah. is agreeing and figuring out oh yeah do we all agree that these are what's important or this is these are the priorities awesome yeah yeah we have a uh, we love Andrea at Ideal Wear. At N10, we love for them. Excellent. I know it's the afternoon, so there must have been one thing. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Um, so for our organization, we are in the infancy stages of really developing a true information system. And um, the qu one question that I took away from the very first presentation that's going to be reverberating in my head is where is our logic model in our information system? Because I think that's going to be something we come back to over and over and over again in terms of what we do and what we actually track and how we report and all of that. So that's going to be a guiding question for us. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm also a big fan of logic models. I work with a lot of organizations helping them plan for technology and do technology plans. And one of the things that I really try and advocate for them to include are those um, uh, logic models that have the outputs and outcomes. Like, how are you going to measure to know if this technology project worked? The same way that you do it to be able to say to a funder, ah, this is you know um, how this program is, you know, the outcomes and the outputs of this program. Um, because one nice thing is when you align your uh, technology plan with your mission and your strategy, then you're able to say, this funder, this is how this investment is going to help us clean up more streams or serve more homeless, not buy the server. Um, because you're, it's a much harder to get funding for to buy the server, but if you're tapping into what's important to the funder about, you know, housing, you know, helping the homeless or cleaning up streams, ah, then you can align that with that. So that's just a secondary advantage, I think, uh, of those logic models. So great. All right, anybody else? Great, Deborah, yeah. Thanks. Um, this, this is sort of what I've aggregated. This isn't from one session, but I've, I've been in great sessions. Thank you, thank you, everyone who's done that. Um, but I've sort of aggregated from this, okay, data needs to be rolled up into information. Information needs to be rolled up into knowledge. And then knowledge needs to be rolled up into wisdom. And so now I'm sort of saying to myself, let's be wisdom driven, not data driven. Although data is still really important, it's the base of the pyramid. It's the important foundation, but it isn't the ultimate thing that should be driving. It's that rolling up that's important. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's uh, for a lot of nonprofits, it's trying to understand how do I move up that ladder? How do I take this? Uh, data and make it into, um, you know, knowledge and the wisdom. And then also, how can I close the loop? How can that wisdom help me act more intelligently in the data I'm collecting, in the actions that I'm taking, all, all of that sort of thing? So yeah, I think that's really right on. So. Excellent. So um, help me again thank all our great speakers. They really did a great job. Yeah, we're really grateful for their help here.